on the Communicators, a discussion on issues before the Federal Communications Commission with Michael Copps, the ranking Democratic Commissioner. And we are pleased to welcome back to the Communicators, FCC Commissioner Michael Copps. Also joining us is Jonathan Make from Communications Daily, where he serves as Assistant Managing Editor. Commissioner Copps, we appreciate your coming over and talking about some of the issues facing the FCC. And I want to jump right in with one of the issues that is a little bit nebulous right now, and it deals with the court case, uh, the Comcast BitTorrent court case, net neutrality, and the FTC. There's a provision in the House Financial Regulatory Bill that would give the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, power over the Internet, thus taking it away from the FCC. What do you think of that, and did I interpret it correctly? Well, I don't know if it's uh, taking away or sharing. You know, this is a, a, a huge uh, infrastructure, ecosystem, uh, information technologies and broadband that we're talking about. Uh, I don't think any uh, one agency or one, any one office has a, has a monopoly on, on addressing it. Uh, I think the FTC has things that it should be doing. I think the FCC has things it should be doing, a lot of things that it should be doing. Uh, so I think there's, uh, there's room for both, and I'm happy to see uh, uh, both agencies uh, interested in this and alive to the responsibilities that they have. They both have jurisdictions. So would you say, though, that the FCC's jurisdiction has been lessened because of the court case? I think the FCC's jurisdiction has been lessened by the uh, horrendous policy decisions that we made back in 2002 and 2005, which uh, uh, issued kind of a guilt-edged invitation to the courts to step in and say, uh, uh, you, you've done that wrong. Jonathan Mink. Sure. Well, just a quick follow-up when you're referring to the 2002 and 2005 decisions. Is that the DSL and cable modem classification as yes, an sir. information service? Right. Well, I guess that brings us to the present now. We've had the Comcast uh, ruling by the D.C. Circuit April 6th. Uh, the big question right now in you know, Washington Telecom and media circles is how will the FCC proceed with net neutrality rules, something you've spoken right. about before and very passionate about it. Uh, is reclassification, uh, that is taking uh, uh, broadband service from a uh, Title I to a Title II uh, common carrier uh, service, the only way that you can see that the FCC can proceed right now and continue its net neutrality proceeding and actually have that become an order? Well, yeah, the, the short answer is yes, I think that's the route to go. But before we get into the arcania of all this, I think it might be helpful for, uh, for your listeners uh, to really understand what's uh, at stake here. You know, we have this absolutely mind-boggling new information infrastructure. We have this f evolving uh, telecommunications infrastructure that offers so much promise, so much potential to the American people to uh, change their lives for the better, to create opportunity, to help them find jobs, take care of themselves, engage in the, uh, in the civic dialogue. And the question is, what rights are consumers going to have to control their online experience? Is this going to be, to the maximum extent possible, give the consumers control over where they go on that internet? what applications they can uh, run on that internet, what devices they can attach, what transparency they can expect from the companies who provide the, uh, uh, the internet uh, uh, services and to expect some competition uh, uh, too. Uh, are we going to work for that or is this going to become the province of the uh, gatekeepers and the toll booth uh, collectors? And uh, the answer to me on that is clear. We've got this wonderful technology probably the most transformative technology since uh, the printing press uh, from the standpoint of doing all the things that I've said before. And we've been heading down the road for the last eight years of saying, well, that's not even telecommunications. It's not advanced telecommunications. So let's, let's call it something else. So we went through this ridiculous intellectual charade uh, in 2000 and, uh, 2002 and 2005. Let's call it something it isn't. Or let's stop calling it what we have been calling it. Uh, so we, we ended up robbing these advanced communications of all the protections that generations of reformers and consumers and advocates had worked so hard to graft, <coughs> excuse me, onto the telecommunications, a basic plain old telephone service, consumer protection, privacy, uh, security and safety uh, for the public. So why, when, why, why don't consumers have a right to expect that that's going to transfer as 
telecommunications evolve. Instead of saying, oh no, we're, we're, we're going to move everything to, the, to broadband here eventually, you know, broadcast, may, everything's going to be on that, but uh, start from, from blank, uh, no consumer protection, no privacy. I mean, that's just, it's, it's uh, ironic, but it's really more than ironic. It's kind of tragic to think that as we move toward this all-encompassing ecostructure or ecosystem, uh, that it's going to be bereft of all of those things. So. When we went through that uh, uh, charade of reclassification, I don't think the folks behind that were really looking to make sure that Title I could serve those purposes. They were looking to get this out from under that, and they were responding to the special interests who basically said, give us a free hand. So fast forward to your question, which I'm not trying to evade, but I think that background uh, uh, is important. Uh, so I think what we did was not, uh, not sustainable uh, from a legal standpoint, and the courts told us that too. Now, do I think the courts could have taken a little more expansive uh, view of uh, Title I than they did? Yes. Do I think they could have shown us a little more deference than they did? They showed us absolutely zero. Uh, uh, yes, I do. This ecosystem is evolving very quickly. We don't have a year or two years or three years or five years to come up with wonderful new uh, uh, permutations of Title I authority. And every time we do that, someone's going to drag us into court. The cleanest way to do this, the best way to do this, in my mind, the only viable way to do this is to reclassify. But wouldn't that... Uh, well, the short answer to your question was yes. Okay. <laughs> but wouldn't that also uh, lead to court cases? Everything we do, I found out in the nine years that I've been there, leads to court cases. So when you go into court, you want to have the best case possible. You want to have the strongest case, and I think that's the strongest way to go. Just say, we're calling this what it is. We're calling this what people have always uh, called it. We're calling it what the American people think it is. Let's treat it that way. And I think that's the best foot forward in the court, rather than trying to invent all these wonderful new, uh, new angles on something that's just going to be quite, that's like a death from a thousand cuts. Well, you are in the majority now, and uh, is it fair to say that you are the only commissioner who has said out loud that we need to move it from Title I to Title II, period? Well, I'm, you know, I'm only going to speak for myself. I have said that out loud. I'll say it again. I'm for classification, reclassification as a, as a Title II service, and uh, I'm hoping when the uh, dust settles that we will have uh, a majority, uh, at least, uh, uh, is in favor of doing that. Let me ask you about the impact of basically not dickering around. You want the commission to move, as you said, sooner rather than later. This shouldn't be a multi-year stage for reclassification. Yeah, we can't afford that. What, is your, what sense have you gotten? Sometimes commissioners meet with investors, even go up to New York and San Francisco, uh, to Wall Street, uh, about the investment community's reaction, let alone the telecommunications industry's reaction. Should there be a reclassification? Would there be uh, a, a flight from these stocks, uh, uh, more uh, 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 risk adversity in terms of an investment strategy? I don't think there's going to be a flight from the most uh, transformative infrastructure uh, uh, change that's taking place in our economy right now. Our future is going to be uh, in this. We have a broadband plan that's uh, dedicated to uh, building broadband out ubiquitously to places where it is not going now. Uh, it's going to be hugely transformative in terms of jobs, in terms of jobs and all of that. So I would hope that the investment community and the political community and the legal community and the judicial community and all of us would take an expansive look at that, just step back a little bit and look, there's no reason that it should do that, calling something what it is and uh, uh, exercising some uh, measure of public uh, interest oversight on it <laughs> should not scare investors off. And, uh, you need, uh, investors need uh, confidence. They need some sense of assurity of the rules. And that's another reason not to go down this experimental route. Are we going to try this new angle on Title I or this or this? And they're going to sit there and say, what are these guys doing? Why don't we just make a decision? This is going to be the, the rule of the road. And I think then investors understand what the game is and they get back in uh, in, in even a bigger fashion and we get on with building this infrastructure that is so important to the future of every citizen in this country. Let me ask about another way to provide certainty, um, and that's something you've spoken very highly of uh, in the past commission. I believe it was 2006, there was an industry public interest uh, compromise that was later enshrined in FCC rules on um, uh, uh, digital uh, multicasting, uh, what, uh, what sorts of ads you can show and for how long. Do you think that there's any way that um, 
uh, all sides in the net neutrality reclassification debate could get together, uh, present the commission with some sort of voluntary uh, solution that might be able to get around the court cases, uh, what some say the uh, concern in the investment right. community of the commission doing something in a mandatory way. Well, I think that would be a, a happy outcome to have that sort of uh, undertaking and conversation hopefully leading to uh, uh, to a consensus, and I think that Chairman Janikowski uh, has, has certainly provided the kind of atmosphere for give and take, as you can see in the whole development of the broadband plan, uh, that would be encouraging of circumstances like that. At the end of the day, though, assuming you get that consensus, and I'm assuming that people would be uh, uh, willing to recognize that that was going to provide the basic uh, guidelines upon which the Commission was going to proceed, and uh, so we would uh, uh, so that that would be apparent to everybody, whether you can do that in a, in a completely voluntary way and have this, uh, not a voluntary way, but a, just have it out there as a, a voluntary guideline or a commitment, uh, or whether the, uh, probably it would be better for the Commission to find some way to recognize that and to uh, uh, affiliate itself with that so you had rules of the road so that when you went to court you were uh, going to court again with your best foot in some uh, Solid, uh, solid ground. A consensus that ends up being adopted as the rule of the road. Well, I think that would be that would be good. I'm not saying it has to end that way, but uh, that would be my reaction at this point. Commissioner Copps, are you pleased with the rollout of the national broadband plan so far? Uh, I am. I think uh, it is the result of the most open and transparent process that I have seen in my nine years at the FCC. We uh, had many, many workshops. We had hearings. Uh, thousands and thousands of, page of uh, pages of uh, records, so it was really in-depth. Uh, the chairman had lots of uh, folks within the FCC, uh, some newer folks he brought in, but uh, most particularly the wonderful team that we have there to really focus on this infrastructure uh, challenge. And uh, I think it was comprehensive. Uh, uh, doesn't mean it's exactly the plan that I would have written or any other commissioner uh, might have written, but I think it was uh, it was something I've been waiting for for nine years. And I, uh, you will recall the other times I've been on the show, I've said, why doesn't this country have a national broadband strategy? Uh, why are we number 15 or 20 or 24, depending upon which year you and I were uh, uh, we're talking here. Let's get in the game. Let's do what every other industrial country in the face of uh, uh, this green earth does, and that's have a broadband plan. So finally, uh, we got uh, a new administration and a Congress who said uh, this is really integral to uh, America's uh, recovery and reinvestment in the future, and they charged us with developing that. I was just happy to see, see them say we should have a broadband plan. It was really music to my ears when they said have the FCC do it, and I think the FCC did a, a, a good and credible job in trying to uh, put something together. we got a long way to go, and there's lots of T's still to cross and I's still to dot before we get you know, broadband ubiquitously out there. Uh, there might be some variations along the way of some of the things we think uh, are going to work, don't end up working, then you've got to be uh, flexible. Uh, two follow-ups to that answer. Number one, do you agree with uh, former FCC Chairman Reed Hunt when he said that broadband is the new national media? Oh, there's no question in my mind that broadband is uh, is uh, is uh, so absolutely fundamental to uh, to the future of our media. Now, how quickly and how much of our media is going to migrate to broadband? I think it's an open question in the next, you know, two years, three years, five years. I am not at all ready to say that we can forget about traditional media now and fast forward and just worry about uh, the media of the future. We do need to have that discussion. I've been calling for that for years and years too. What happens uh, if and when uh, radio and television uh, move there and, and if newspapers uh, really continue to diminish, how do you protect the public interest in that? And that's a conversation we need to have. But for the next, I think, many, several years, the folks in the traditional media the newspapers and the broadcast stations are still going to produce the overwhelming bulk of the news and information that this country gets. It's anywhere now between 80 and 95 percent. Even the news that you uh, that folks read on the internet comes from the uh, from the newspaper and the broadcast stations. There's not as much of it as there used to be because of the crisis that we've had in uh, journalism and in the industries generally. There's less news. That's unfortunate, but it is coming from there, and we need to figure out 
what happens to that journalism, what happens to that diminishing news and information in this period of possibly years as we migrate to the new media because I don't think that this country can really afford to have four or five or six or ten more years of the kind of disintegration and diminution of journalism that we have seen in the last uh, 15 or 20 years with newsrooms shuttered, investigative reporting being uh, an endangered uh, species, of cops in the... You know, we have 27 states, I am told, 27 states no longer have an accredited reporter on Capitol Hill. If it is one of the functions of journalism to hold the powerful accountable, how do you hold them accountable when you're, when you're not covering them? I see it down at, at the FCC. We've got uh, uh, good folks like Jonathan and a few others, but we don't have as many reporters covering that place, covering what Mike Copps is doing or Julius Janikowski or anybody else. And it's good to have that coverage, and the people need to have that coverage. So I think that, and this is a longer discussion, but I just think from Sam, some of the bad private sector decisions that have been made and the bad public sector decisions that have been made with our traditional media, that we are skating perilously close to denying the American people the depth and breadth of information they need to uh, dispatch and discharge their duties uh, and responsibilities as citizens. And, final thought, uh, I am worried that new media is starting down that same road of traditional media, of too much consolidation, too many bad private sector decisions, too many bad public sector decisions. And I think uh, Jonathan Make will have a follow-up on that, but first, one more follow-up with regard to broadband. Uh, do you see the Universal Service Fund, how do you see it being affected with money going toward uh, traditional uh, telephone uh, services and broadband, and do you see a need for an increase in the USF? Yeah, we, we need to use universal service as a critical tool to help us reach our objectives. By no means is it the only tool that's going to get you broadband ubiquitously deployed in this uh, country. And obviously private sector investment is the lead locomotive of this economy, always has been and uh, always will be. But the universal service fund can play, I think, a uh, mightily uh, uh, important role in supporting that. It is necessary to uh, modify that uh, fund and make it primarily a broadband fund. Uh, we still have some challenges, as you know, in, in voice. In some areas, go to Indian country and other places like that, where uh, you're lucky if you have uh, two thirds of, of the folks even have uh, wire or voice service. So we can't get out of that business. But by and large, we need to transform it into the infrastructure of the future. And universal service has a, has a role to play in that. And uh, I understand about contribution factors and all that, and people get nervous, and I get nervous too. But this job not going to get done on the cheap, and I'm, I'm not into making promises that, uh, that we're going to hold the Universal Service Fund at such and such a level forever and ever. I don't think that's the way you make intelligent policy judgments. This is C-SPAN's Communicators Program. Our guest is FCC Commissioner Michael Copps. Jonathan Make of Communications Daily is also with us. Uh, Commissioner Copps, uh, you raise a number of interesting points about both traditional and new media. Some of that, of course, relates to the uh, execution of the National Broadband Plan, which we were just speaking about. So to take one uh, data point, if you will, uh, part of the plan sees TV stations in large markets essentially giving back some or all of their spectrum so that there can be more, faster, uh, wireless uh, broadband uh, as that occurs, what concerns does that raise in your mind about continuing to have the, as you would like to see, vigorous public interest oversight of TV stations if there are fewer of them and some of them are giving back a chunk of their air airwaves? How do you achieve both of those things? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, and uh, I'm hoping it's a question that we'll, we will be alive to. There's no question in my mind that uh, we need more spectrum for wireless technologies. Exactly how much, uh, I don't know. Uh, and we will be doing some, uh, some measurements, and Congress is considering a, a spectrum inventory bill so we would uh, understand exactly how much spectrum is being used in this country right this minute as the three of us talk here. Nobody has a clue how much of it is being used and how much of it is just kind of uh, sitting there and would be available uh, for other uses. So, uh, so the first thing to do is to get that kind of, of, uh, of a feel for it. But we, we do know we're going to need more spectrum. Uh, I think there are some areas in the country uh, uh, where some of that broadcast spectrum might be freed up. 
but it raises a lot of uh, questions uh, how you do that. First of all, you, you need to have some uh, congressional authority to do that, and uh, uh, we'll have to see uh, how that evolves. But to me, all spectrum is public interest spectrum, and its utilization in every sphere and sector all across that broad swath needs to be judged from the public interest. But this broadcast spectrum is particularly public interest oriented because we rely so heavily on it to inform the American people. And my advice to broadcasters um, uh, is this. Uh, if you want to really make sure uh, that that spectrum is, is not going to be uh, uh, too much of it taken away, figure out what the best public use of that spectrum is right now. I said to them years and years ago, we're going digital. We're going to have all of this uh, uh, multicast opportunity so that in the same, with the same amount of spectrum that you broadcast at one standard definitional channel, you can not only do high D, you can do three or four other program streams, and those program streams could reflect your local communities. That's broadcasting strength, local contacts, local communities. So you can do a better job of covering the diverse elements of your community. What are they contributing to your community? What issues are they interested in? You can do a better job of covering local politics. I mean, every time we have an election year, I search in vain on TV for coverage of local races because, uh, because they don't do a very good job, uh, by and large, uh, of covering all those things. So that's really public interest broadcasting. Get some independent producers in there, showcase local music, local talent, and, uh, uh, and all the rest. And, you know, had they done that, uh, more than that. I'm not saying nobody has done that, but it, it hasn't reached anywhere near uh, uh, critical mass. A lot of that spectrum is not, uh, most of it is not being used for purposes like that. But had it been used for that, I think people would have been much more reluctant to uh, uh, come up with ideas for let's take that spectrum away. So I want to see that spectrum used for public interest and when the time comes, if it comes that we really go th forward with this plan, that's kind of how I'm going to be looking at it. Uh, if that spectrum is really being used for the enhancement of uh, the public interest in local areas, to, for the enhancement of localism and diversity, I would be uh, uh, much more amenable to keeping that spectrum in the hands of the broadcasters. Well, uh, I guess in a way that's a double-edged sword. You're saying in, in part broadcasters, or at least some, have brought this uh, present stage uh, uh, on themselves, but on the other hand, they can uh, show that their airwaves should not be repurposed by doing more that's in the, in the, mind, the public right. interest. That's, that's, that's me talking. How, though, can you get buy-in from TV stations, of which there has been very little publicly, and also from their lobbying mm -hmm. groups here in Washington, the National Association of Broadcasters, the Association for Maximum Service Television? Well, uh, they have said, look, our members are not interested. We want to serve the public. We uh, want to use all of our spectrum, but we can't do that while also fully serving the public interest if we have to give back some of that spectrum. So how, how can that be balanced? Well, they can engage in the discussion, and I had this discussion with the, uh, with the NAB as, uh, as recently uh, as yesterday. Why don't we tee this up? I mean, uh, uh, these folks are a little bit on the defensive with regard to uh, some of this, uh, the spectrum plans that are out there, spectrum fees and uh, all of that. So I would think the time would be ripe for them and to engage in uh, some discussions with folks who wish broadcasting a, a full and uh, fulsome uh, uh, future. It shouldn't be hard to do. I've, I travel around this country. I talk not only to the uh, associations here in Washington, but I talk to a lot of state broadcasters. There are a lot of broadcasters in this country in whose breasts the flame of the public interest still burns brightly. It's more and more difficult for them to do their job in the consolidated environment that we've evolved into in this country. It's harder and harder to justify that expenditure on local news when Wall Street is saying, well, you made 10 percent last year, you've got to do 15 this year, so you struggle and cut, you get to 15, and then they say, oops, sorry, we're going to 20, you've got to keep the investment community happy. That's not the, uh, that's not the future for the kind of uh, news and information that this country needs. And uh, that was the deal in the first place. You guys get this spectrum, the public spectrum, the people's spectrum for free in return for being good stewards of it and providing people with the news and information that they need. Well, what about an update on, then on the uh, NBC Comcast potential merger? 
from well, the Well, I don't know what the update view. would be. There is no update from me. I, uh, I have always said that that would be, uh, uh, that remains a steep climb. As you know, I have not been uh, very enamored with industry consolidation in the past. I think it's been highly destructive for uh, not only the public interest, uh, I think a lot of companies too. I think there are a lot of broadcasters now who, uh, uh, who might be looking back and saying maybe maybe that uh, hyper speculative phase that they got involved in ended up being not so good uh, uh, after all. So there's a lot of them want to do uh, want to do a good job. We have to work to create environment, an environment, in which that's possible. We have got to do a better job of getting the news and information to people. And that's the biggest challenge facing us in the communications field right now. That's the number one thing that I respond to because I really am worried about how do we get information out to American people. This is not a new problem for the United States of America. You can go back to the founding fathers and you can find the quotes from George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison saying that the infrastructure of that day, which was newspapers, was mightily important to everybody in the country. So they found a way to support that information infrastructure with postal subsidies for newspapers. They didn't pick newspapers. They didn't pick winners and losers. Uh, there were partisan papers on all sides. They said all those newspapers should get postal subsidy. Uh, newspapers should be able to ship to newspapers free and there should be subsidies to get them out there. Uh, that was the, the premise of, uh, of their experiment, of their democracy, of the country they were building. They really didn't know if they could make that Republic work that far flung country. So they said, we got to get information out to the American people. And that's the same challenge that we have now. We've, they found ways to do it. Uh, we found ways to, uh, to encourage that with spectrum for the broadcasters. And now we have, uh, we have that challenge again. So it's, it's, it's the technologies change, uh, the lingo changes, the democratic, small d democratic challenge remains throughout the course of our history. Jonathan, make final question. Sure. Uh, following up on your concerns about any media transaction, Comcast says if, if you, the FCC, and, and the Justice Department allow us to buy NBC Universal, NBC will be a stronger property. Uh, we're going to, we're committed to keeping it uh, uh, over the air. So mm -hmm. are there, two-prong question, is there a way that that would actually be beneficial to the public interest? And then you mm -hmm. often have talked about transparency. Mm -hmm. While keeping that in mind, how can the Commission make sure that its review of the deal is as transparent as possible? I think we should have some hearings on I think we should have some public hearings. This is not without precedent that uh, at the FCC. We did that back with uh, AOL, uh, the case, uh, uh, some years ago. We've done it on, uh, on other occasions, too. Uh, and I think... Uh, I think you have to really look at it. There are a lot of questions to, uh, to be asked here. You know, is this going to have an impact on uh, uh, consumer rights and on cable? Is it going to have an access on access to, uh, is it going to have an impact on access to uh, the internet? Uh, what's it going to do to programming? What's it going to do to local news and uh, all of those things? A stronger NBC, yes, we could use a stronger NBC in some ways. Uh, maybe not in others. So we, we really have to get in and, and measure that. Again, I'm the guy who's about localism and diversity, and I think uh, democracy flourishes when you have uh, uh, when you have that control in the community uh, to the extent possible in broadcasting, in newspapers, and all the rest. And we've been heading in the wrong direction for the last 25 or 30 years. As always, Commissioner Cops, we appreciate your coming on the Communicators to talk about the issues facing the FCC. Jonathan Make of Communications Daily, thank you also. Thank you.